I'm Nick, I'm from Imperial College in London, and uh, we're co-chairing the session on representation learning and unsupervised learning. Great, yeah, and uh, just to remind everyone, this is a short uh, oral session, so we will have uh, papers in groups of three. Um, so first have the authors of the first three papers briefly introduce themselves and their work, and then there will be time for questions. So any questions, please play, place them in the chat and mention uh, the paper ID, the first three are J1, J2, and J3. So, um, Hendrik Luke, I think you're the first. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, hello and thanks for joining into the presentation of our work. Uh, I'm Hendrik Kluck, I'm a student at ETH Zurich. And I'm presenting a project that I did under the supervision of Thomas Sutter and Professor Julia Vogt at the Medical Data Science Group in ETH Zurich. So methods for multimodal, unsupervised, and generative learning have been evaluated extensively on synthetic data sets mostly, but have not been tested on more challenging real medical data. So here we evaluate a method that can encode different data types into a latent distribution, such that one can sample from this learned distribution in order to reconstruct or generate these multiple data types. And we apply this method on three data types from the mimic seeds R database, a front of view radiograph, a lateral view radiograph, and a corresponding text report that was written by a radiologist. So this model could theoretically be used for downstream tests like classification, for pathologies or generating texts for the radiologists, or simply uh, generating a lateral view radiograph given a frontal one to limit radiation exposure. And also since this method is scalable, any data type could be add, added, added to provide more information uh, such as electronic health records, for example. And using very, very basic architectures without any bells and whistles, we find that the MOPO method provides promising results, but that we believe can be improved further, especially using more ad hoc architectures for the each encoder and decoder, or with methods that have been shown to uh, provide less blurry samples, such as the vector quantized variation autoencoder or the hierarchical variation autoencoder. And I'm currently trying to find a more flexible method for merging these unimodal latent spaces in the different modalities as my master thesis. So thanks for your attention, and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks a lot. Um, next author is uh, Alexander Campo. Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. The goal of our work is the unsupervised representation learning of functional neuroimaging data of the brain. To do this, our method represents fMRI data as a discrete time dynamic graph. Nodes in the graph are biologically defined regions of interest, with edges between the nodes defined by a statistical measure of connectivity such as correlation. We then learn a probabilistic latent variable model of the graph, which is capable of dynamically clustering regions of interest over time. These clusters reveal meaningful structure within the data which can be used for downstream tasks such as classification or regression. And as, as an example in our work, we use a large sample of data from the UK Biobank. On the task of biological sex classification, we achieve an area under the curve score of 0.81. All the probability distributions in our model are parameterized by neural networks, making inference fast and scalable, and the possibility of extensions by integrating other data sources and phenotypes simple. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Excellent, thanks a lot. Uh, next up, Daniel Wolf. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah. Um, hello, guys. Um, I'm presenting um, the work um, we performed in the University of Lübeck in the Institute for Robotic and Cognitive Systems. Um, the overall goal of this work was um, to quantify if, um, the autoencoders, conventional autoencoder, variational autoencoder, and the slice Wasserstein autoencoder are usable for a patch target tracking in time resolved 3D ultrasound. Uh, for this, we um, only considered for, simpli for simplicity uh, deformed and translated autoencoders, uh, uh, target motion, sorry. Um, we mapped the um, target patches into a, a latent space of a dimensionality of 123, and um, we performed a clustering algorithm inside the representation space. Um, to quantify the results, um, we uh, uh, performed um, a clustering algorithm and evaluated the distribution inside um, 
the representation space and the precision of the clustering algorithm. Um, yeah, thank you, and thanks for your questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, if there are any questions, please type them in the chat. Um, there's one question for the first paper, and I think that's mainly about understanding the purpose of the multimodality approach. Question is uh, whether the purpose is to um, generate complete multimodal data based on a sample with missing multimodal data. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So yeah, that's one of the purposes to basically learn the joint distribution of all modalities, such that uh, yeah, when given uh, a subset of modalities, you can generate all the other modalities, all the other modalities as well. Yeah. And at the moment, your images are uh, still quite blurry and quite different from uh, realistic images. Do you have any idea what exactly. uh, it would take exactly, to yeah. really generate realistic images? Yeah, so um, I mean they they resemble so the shape uh, resembles the original images it's just that they're very blurry, and uh, like the pathologies uh, that are in the data set they are mostly small details and these are lost in the in the generated samples. So. Yeah, do you have any idea how uh, you could improve the method further to get better uh, better quality images? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I mean, that's a big question, right? So um, I think so. I would like to use uh, to try out uh, like the vector quantized uh, variation autoencoder because um, it has been shown that they generate uh, really clear samples. And um, yeah, I'm not so sure if uh, using bigger models as the encoder or the decoder would improve the results by much, but that could be tried out as well. Yeah, um, and I noticed in your uh, results table that the difference between using frontal and text and using also the lateral frontal and text is really small. Well, uh, yeah. between lateral and text and everything is a bit bigger. If any idea why that might be? Yeah, I mean that's also um, in the dataset description. Like radiologists say, radiologists say that the, the lateral view actually does not uh, give much information. Um, compared to the front of one, and I mean the text. So in the text, uh, the actual pathology is uh, actually written there by the pathology uh, by the um, radiologist. Sorry. So I mean that that's actually the easiest modality to um, to model, right? Because it has the actual label in there. For the text, you just use some um, uh, word embedding, basically, right? Or a word encoding. So does it essentially mean that your vocabulary is limited to a few words? Exactly, yeah. So I had a vocabulary of uh, 2,900 words, something like this. And uh, yeah, maybe that also, for the text, it could be improved with using like a transformer kind of model. Yeah. A uh, question for the second paper. Um, so one thing is that uh, the edges in your approach, basically how you define the edges, depend on your functional connectivity measure. Um, do you have any idea how sensitive uh, the whole approach is actually to how you define this? Yeah, so in order to define the graph, um, we can either have um, an unweighted or an, a weighted graph. So unweighted would be a binarized connectivity matrix, or weighted would be um, sort of continuous values. So in order to make it comparable to existing literature on static functional connectivity, we just used uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient and we thresholded it uh, so that we only had um, absolute values above 0.6. Um, we can easily integrate other um, methods of measuring functional connectivity, so like partial correlation, um, but, um, or we can include like multiple because we can have multiple genitive processes for the edge sets. Um, but just for this experiment, we just kept it with correlation, here's the correlation coefficient, just because we wanted it to be comparable with other functional connectivity baselines. Okay. 
Um, and the question that came up in the study group this morning um, was that you present results for different length of sequence, basically the, uh, the time domain, and that the, basically the best results were, I think, for 35 uh, time points, but that for 70 time points, performance suddenly dropped quite a lot. Yeah, so because like, in order to build the graph representation, we use um, existing methods of dynamic functional connectivity. So we use the most common one, which was Windows-based. And uh, because obviously it's an open question what size of Windows to calculate the correlation across, we cross-validated on the UK Biobank data set, and that was the optimal window that we found. But moving forward, it'd be interesting to see if we can um, use a measure of connectivity to represent the graph, which is free of having to find the Windows parameter. Um, also, it would be interesting to see how the window changes across different data sets and or whether it's different for so task versus rest. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, question in chat for the last paper, the third paper. Um, that's a question about um, the sliced Wasserstein autoencoder. Apparently your conclusion was that this shows the best results on the translation test sets. Um, and on the other hand, you're motivated that the feature vector should depend on the translation, or that's at least what you expect. So doesn't that mean that the uh, sliced Wasserstein autoencoder gave the worst results because the feature vectors could still be clustered? Um, well, the feature vectors could not be clustered in a good way, um, even in the translation um, test set. Um, we just saw that um, even in the translated um, test set, the size Wasserstein autoencoder um, performed best compared to the other ones. Um, apart from that, um, in all three um, autoencoders in the translated uh, translation test set, um, the clustering alg um, algorithm performed um, a very bad, um, and to put it in that words. Yeah, and you mentioned that you ignored rotation for now. Do you have any intuition what uh, would be needed to add that or what to expect then? Rotation is um, very difficult for ultrasound images um, because we cannot only rotate images. Um, it's not realistic um, in terms of the um, physical um, um, acquirement of the ultrasound images. Um, to also uh, consider rotation images, um, we either should be able to um, acquire different ultrasound images at different angles, for example, mm -hmm. um, or we should be able to um, augment realistic um, ultrasound images in, in different angles. Um, but for now, that's not possible, unfortunately. No. There's another question. Do the samples always cluster? And if not, uh, do you have any insight when they do and when they don't? Uh, I don't get the question, sorry. Can you repeat it? Um, well, I can only read what was written in the chat. Uh, do the samples always cluster? So I suppose um, the patches that you have, do they always end up in clusters? And if not, uh, do you have any insight when they do, do or do not? So suppose, for example, for the default okay. case, you have cases yeah. that end up somewhere else. Well, we saw for all um, patches, even when there's not much uh, structure inside, um, that there are clusters. Um, a little bit um, depends on how much structure is inside the patch. Um, the example I gave here on the, on the left side um, is the vessel bifurcation, so there's very much um, structure inside, and um, we could see in such cases that the clusters are um, really uh, small. Um, on the other hand, when there's less um, structure inside, the clusters become broader, and um, yeah. No. But for a deviation test set, we were always able to, to cluster it. Sometimes um, there were some errors, but um, um, in, in the main part, um, the clusters are successful. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think we have to move on to the next three papers. Yep. So the next paper will be first presented by uh, Wei Shi, I think. Sorry for the pronunciation. Or, oh no, Hannes, Janis is here, sorry about that. If Janis is presenting.
So, so I start, not YG first. Uh, I think he should start, but I don't see him. Okay. No. Yeah. Oh no. Sorry. Yes. Oh yeah. There's. Right, oh, there, there is somebody in the um, chat, but not panel. So sorry. Could uh, someone move into the panelists? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Xie Wei Yi, and uh, uh, we are from the Radman University Medical Center, and uh, uh, our work is about uh, 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 emphysema subtyping, uh, in which we want to uh, define a subtypical uh, among emphysema subjects, so that uh, maybe later we can find the mapping between certain subgroups and some uh, clinical variables. And in this work, we use a holistic approach to define subtypes, which is based on deep clustering framework. Uh, traditional works are based on the there are clustering uh, clustering approach but they were mostly based on the handcraft features before so i think this is the first contribution a uh, major contribution of, of our work and the second contribution is that we use the the dense features from the segmentation network for the clustering training uh, which is different from the existing work uh, where the or mostly based on the using the uh, top features at the lowest resolution from the combat for uh, clustering or classification training. And in our results, we show that uh, our clustering methods can achieve the silhouette coefficient at uh, a moderate good level, which is 0 0.54. And uh, in the future, we want to apply this approach uh, to see if there are some correlations between the cluster found by our approach and some underlying genetic factors. And thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for your presentation. And next on will be Yannis Hagenau. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, you might be surprised, but this is not to interrupt you in your chats today, but <laughs> to present to you our work on discrete pseudo-healthy synthesis in the context of uh, personalized prothesis shaping. So when a patient comes to the hospital and we want to shape a personalized prosthesis, it's typically not possible to extract the desired prosthesis shape directly from a medical image because this image typically shows a pathological shape, which is obviously not the desired prosthesis shape. So the only information we can extract from the medical image is surrogate information. For example, the pathological shape of the organ at risk. And um, we can try to estimate a healthy shape from the surrogate information. And, and this estimated healthy shape can serve as a prosthesis shape. And uh, this mapping process is what we call pseudo-healthy synthesis. Um, previously published methods for pseudo-healthy synthesis um, basically always features a continuous prediction, which means that the uh, prosthesis is drawn from a continuum, which means for each patient we uh, completely design a completely new, novel and new um, prosthesis. And even though this is really personalization, um, this comes at really, really high costs. And from a clinical application point of view, um, it comes with huge challenges also from a regulatory point of view. Um, so what we ask ourselves is um, whether there is something in between this full personalization on the one hand side and something like the one size fits all approach as it is done now in uh, clinical practice. And so what is in between there? And so we came up with a discrete pseudo-healthy synthesis approach and where we just um, do some unsupervised typification of the of the healthy shapes that serve as a set of prosthesis shapes and we uh, draw from our prosthesis from this discrete set. This is several really amazing advantages um, and if you're interested in these advantages I'm happy to uh, discuss them with you or um, also discuss them at my poster. Thank you. Thank you Janis and last on will be Matteo Tanhofer. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi everybody, my name is Matteo and I am a PhD student at the University of, of Udine in Italy. In our paper, we deal with the problem of disorder recognition in MRI scans of the knee. Many studies in the orthopedic literature show that the visual scenes 
to detect anomalies such as the ACL and the meniscus tears appear usually very small and are often localized in particular areas of the MRI images. Despite the good uh, accuracy achieved, the current deep learning solution for this problem ignores such relevant information when making prediction about the presence of anomalies. We have designed a new convolutional architecture called MR PeerNet, composed of a feature pyramid network and of pyramid detail pooling modules. These are designed to extract more detailed information from the MR slice and do not require any additional annotations if not labels for the presence or absence of the disorders. Our proposed structure is very general and in our experiments we applied it to, state of, to two state of the art pipelines. And we demonstrated that their diagnostic capabilities improved because of MRPNet's ability to detect better features related to the anomalies. Basically, that's it, and I look forward to discuss with you in the Q&A or in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start with questions for J4. So um, the first presenter being uh, G. And one question that came up was, is the draining strategy always convergent? And is this an established method of proof, or is it a heuristic? Uh, talking about deep clustering, I believe. Thank you for the questions. Uh, uh, to the first question, I think the, if you check our video uh, presentation, uh, I show the image uh, where we compute the, the uh, normalized uh, mutual index between uh, two consecutive epochs, and uh, that one actually converts to 0 0.85 which means there is a small, still small amount of uh, um, cluster real zone for each epoch, meaning that the model is not converged. Uh, but in terms of the result, we think the, in terms of cluster, cluster separation defined by the silhouette coefficient, we think the model performs quite well. To the second question, uh, this is, uh, I think the current state of art, a uh, deep cluster framework in using deep learning for clustering and actually the the latest approach is called uh, the same also also published deep cluster version 2 and also there is a work called self-label and we actually try to both up approach on our data set and uh, actually the deep cluster version 1 is already performed quite well compared to the latest development in this field i hope that answered the question yeah, thank you for this answer. Um, there was a, another question coming up around the clustering, where the question was how sensitive is the clustering algorithm to the initialization? Actually, it, I, we think it's quite robust. Uh, in our uh, experiments, we just do the random animation. We use this uh, 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 isolation, and the result is, uh, I think it's, uh, quite good from the start. We, okay. we don't think it's very sensitive to the, to the different approach of the initialization. Yeah, I saw in your paper that you're mentioning that um, random features already give relatively well um, good yes. information. So I guess this is what you're referring to. Yeah, I, actually, before the experiment, we expect to see the, the cluster kind of collapse in the first few iterations because you know, the easiest one is just to assign all the training members to one cluster. But I mean, with the random initialization, uh, it does not happen. So it's also trial versus surprises. Okay, thank you for this answer. Um, I guess one more question around um, interpretability of your method. Um, First of all, have you considered upsampling the baseline acti uh, activations rather than doing um, Pull on dense features as like a different way of um, interpretability, and uh, further on, following on that, um, how do you actually interpret those um, activation maps? There, and do you think that this is something useful yeah. in practice? This is a good question. Uh, to the first part of the question, we we did up something, but it's if you use like uh, top features at a low resolution, no matter what sampling you do, we actually tried using the the the, the tricks that they find in in the GradCam paper. They actually did release, uh, like only consider the, the positive signals, but we tried both approach. It's always looked like a large blob, 
not a very localized uh, aggregation app. So that is why we want to use dense features. And the second part, I think it's um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I think this is is quite a difficult to interpret because if you think if you think about the the deep clustering on this medical data set is different from the clustering on the uh, natural image data set where the object is actually quite homogeneous. I don't know if I use the correct word. But in medical image field, if you consider the features inside the lung, I mean, it can be anything, but however, uh, based on our experience, we think why it is corresponding to the emphysema severity is that because the severity is the most intuitive way to actually to recognize that a lot because you basically find the the regions or the volume of those dark regions i think that's the easiest the features to work that is why the model interpreted as as such kind of capturing those those, those information because if, if you want to align six clusters can be anything so, but our said we, we actually show that the model actually responds to actually the Yeah, thanks a lot for um, responding to those questions. Um, moving on for timing reasons. Um, Yanis, how did you choose the number of clusters for coming up with different um, categorical like symbols or shapes? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting, um, interesting parameter of our method. Um, it really depends on how many clusters we want to have there because each cluster center is basically one per thesis shape. And um, the cool thing about this method is that uh, we use outer encoding, which basically means when we cluster in latent space, we can uh, reconstruct an image or synthesize an image of each and every cluster, which is each per thesis shape. And then we can, in the end, uh, perform analysis. And when we have this set of per thesis shapes, we can, um, for each observed shape that we observed in the wild or in our data set we can compare this to the closest cluster so um, we can we can quantitatively assess how good we can um, we can mimic or fit the, the whole um, variety of shapes with our now set of clusters with a specific number of cluster centers and um, yeah like this we can we can um, assess some curves where we can see that um, that we come to some saturation and to, to be honest in, in this study uh, the data set was too small to really come to very nice saturation curve but at least we could uh, find some some trade off between um, the number of pathesis that we use and um, yeah how much we we get from adding more cluster centers we can do this quantitatively thanks a lot um, a different question that also came up in the chat is whether you were considering using GANs or I guess generally other um, judge models there and um, does this work or is there some um, some combination of discrete symbols that would be better? Yeah, well, um, of, of course, especially for pseudo synthesis in, in segmentation tasks, the guns are the state of the art. And that one problem with guns or with adversarial um, approaches in general is that they aim on um, learning the full distribution of samples and then they, um, they sample from this full distribution. And um, therefore, in, an adversarial approach will basically always um, present some healthy shape but not the individual one, or it's pretty challenging to say, don't give me some healthy shape or some prothesis, but the one that is individually optimal for the specific patient. So what we call the patient identity to spare. And this is pretty challenging to integrate and um, specific um, previous methods um, for integrating this don't really work in our setting because, um, for example, segmenting the areas that are pathological doesn't work because um, when the full organ is deformed, then the full organ is a segmentation and then the segmentation doesn't help. So um, the adversarial methods were not really good. And maybe one short comment um, on stability because uh, guns, we all know how uh, guns can fail in giving realistic results. The cool thing about our method is um, by clustering in latent space and having this specific set, we implicitly constrain our method to always predict a realistic and typical shape because there can't be any, anything else when we classify on typical shapes. So uh, we basically will, will never predict something that is unrealistic or really strange. And this is a quite significant advantage of our method. This sounds, sounds very useful. Thanks a lot. Um, moving on again um, yeah, thank you. to Matteo. Um, are the classification head and the feature extractor trained together, or do you have like um, a two-stage process or something in place there? 
Thanks for the for the question. Uh, we have an end-to-end -end, uh, learning stage, so we applied uh, our MRP net structure to standard backbones, the backbones of uh, MRNet and LNet, and train according to the original training method. So without any particular tuning of the hyperparameters, we just uh, plug it in uh, and train according to to the original learning stage. We also made uh, some experiments uh, following a two-stage approach, but we didn't see any any improvement, at least yet. It's always nice to hear that things just work plug and play rather than having to be fine tuned or anything. Um, so moving on uh, for another question, there was um, how are the features extra extracted at each layer to um, use to improve the detection or diagnosis? So yeah, th this is done through the pyramid detail pooling module, which uh, uh, receives uh, the feature computed by the feature pyramid network and uh, extracts uh, uh, multiple vectors by analyzing the, the feature maps at different uh, levels of detail. So we start from the full feature maps and then we pull a smaller area around the center of the feature maps in order to focus on a smaller area. And this is done until the, the, the feature maps is, uh, is reduced to, to a minimum, uh, to the minimum number of uh, diverse detail uh, the module is configured. And uh, yeah, all, all the feature vectors that are computed in this way are then concatenated together, and that forms the, the feature vector that represents the, the MRI slides at multiple levels of detail. Thanks a lot. Uh, this was the last question for uh, the session, and uh, we're going to move on to the next three papers being J7 till J9. And um, the first one will be presented by Uman uh, Gupta. Uh, hi, uh, hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yep, you are audible and okay. visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Umang. Uh, I'm from University of Southern California, and this work was in collaboration or was joint work from uh, folks at Information Sciences Institute USC and Keck School of Medicine USC. Uh, so uh, our work is uh, about a membership inference attacks on uh, 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 deep regression models for neuroimaging. Uh, the main motivation behind this work uh, was that uh, the data privacy laws uh, restrict data sharing. However, they don't say much about uh, sharing models uh, trained on this private data. And in this work, we explore what kind of privacy uh, leakage can happen when these models are shared. In particular, we, uh, uh, we show the privacy leakage uh, revealed by uh, membership inference attacks. Uh, in, uh, what this attacks involve inferring is uh, is just given a sample, uh, they involve inferring if uh, your sample was used for training uh, or not. And by, by, by just by knowing this, an adversary can, uh, can figure out a lot of information about the sample. Uh, uh, so in this, uh, in this work, we replicate these results on the neuroimaging tasks uh, across different architectures and across different training setups, like centralized training setup and federated uh, training setup. Uh, Finally, we also show that the benefits of mitigating or addressing this uh, privacy leakages go beyond just ensuring privacy because this uh, attacks or the performance of these attacks are uh, are uh, highly correlated with overfitting. And so if we if we can mitigate these attacks, perhaps we could also come up with more, uh, uh, perhaps we could also come up with training algorithms uh, that would generalize better. Uh, that's the brief of this work. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about it more during the poster session, or uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. Next up is uh, Christina. Yeah, hi. Uh, hope you can hear me. So uh, my name is Christina Zulba. Uh, I'm from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And I'm happy to talk to you about uh, our work on guided filter regularization for diffeomorphic autoencoders. So the initial situation uh, we imagined was, let's say we have three different hospitals that all acquire T1 sequences of brain MRIs. Um, however, they all use different devices such that the uh, images look slightly different to each other. They have different intensity profiles, they have different noise ratios. 
And now we want to perform a population-based analysis on all of those images. However, we somehow need to distinguish between the um, shape variations uh, that are just due to the normal anatomical variation or pathologies uh, occurring in the patients, and also the appearance variations that uh, might be only due to the different devices that were used in this case. So we proposed a uh, autoencoder-based method to disentangle the shape and appearance of images, uh, and it is kind of a combination of a diffeomorphic and a diffeomorphic autoencoder, uh, which we boosted with a uh, guided filter regularization to improve the disentanglement of shape and appearance, uh, so we can completely separate them. And I'll be happy to uh, tell you more about the method in detail on my poster or show you some interesting results. And happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks. And finally, uh, Camila. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, so I'm Camila Gonzalez from the Medical and Environmental Computing Lab at the Technical University of Darmstadt. I will briefly present my IANUVANS paper. So there are many deep learning algorithms that successfully segment cardiac structures from sign MR images. But as you can see in the first image, generalizing to unseen vendors is an open challenge. In this work, we explore how cell supervision can help detect when a sample is out of distribution due to being acquired at a different center and with a different scanner vendor. We know that deep neural networks only produce meaningful outputs for in-distribution data. This manifests in a drop in performance for auto distribution data for both the target task, in our case segmentation, and the self-supervised proxy task. As the proxy task does not require manual annotations, we can calculate the proxy loss during deployment, which is the basis of our method. We combine this with uncertainty estimation to form our novelty function. Ideally, the function would indicate when a sample is out of distribution for any self-supervised model. In this work, we evaluated on two architectures, one with a contrastive learning proxy task and one with edge detection. We find that our novelty function reliably detects out of distribution samples and achieves the highest separation between in distribution and out of distribution data for both explored architectures, though better for contrastive learning. Future work should assess the reliability of our method for other models and proxy tasks. That was a brief overview of the paper, and I as well would love to answer your questions and meet you later at the poster session. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left for some questions. Um, let's start with um, the membership uh, inference attack paper. One question was um, whether you could explain a bit more what the privacy threat model is that you had in mind for this problem and um, what you mean with access to the training distributions. So I suppose the question is what what is really necessary to uh, attack these models in this way? So uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, that gives me some more uh, chance to go in details about the attacks. So the way uh, this attacks happen is like we assume that we have access to uh, our trained model and uh, some more uh, samples from the training distribution. So uh, this way you can emulate the training setup. Like we, we assume some kind of uh, knowledge of the training setup and some knowledge of training samples too, uh, or, or training distribution at least, so that uh, you can train a model and like emulate what, uh, 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 what uh, a, a classifier is doing uh, so that you can extract features like gradients and prediction error out of it. Uh, to predict, uh, to to be to be able to predict uh, which sample was used in training set or not. Um, do you have any uh, idea what the size, what role the size of the data set plays? Like if you would have a really big data set, does it become more difficult? Yes. So uh, I think like uh, since we see that this this kind of attacks are correlated with overfitting. Uh, and like this has been observations across other papers too. So probably if you increase the size of the data set, uh, the attacks might become more difficult. But if you still have like some kind of samples which are like lying in a small area or like you have small amount of samples that are very different from your cohort, then you can easily identify those samples at least. Yeah, makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, there was also a question about uh, the 3D and the 2D data set. Because uh, in the oh, study group, yeah. we noticed that there was quite a big difference in performance uh, in the tasks. Um, do you have any idea why that uh, could be? So I think like, uh, so in terms of uh, the performance of the models on, on the real task, um, so I think like uh, the paper that proposed these two models was uh, also, I think this was, uh, again, I wrote the figure. Uh, so the main reason was that the 3D CNN needs like more parameters and, uh, and like the, the data set that we use is UK Biobank that has roughly, uh, I think 8,000 samples for training or 6,000 samples for training. So the main problem is like 3D CNN has more parameters, does it overfits or like it, it does not learn properly with that kind of small data set. But if you look at 2D slice CNN, they are easier to train. And uh, we have seen this kind of uh, difference in performance, not just for the brainage problem, but internally we have been seeing this kind of difference for other problems too. So it may be that using a 2D network and like combining them uh, uh, like they did in this, like we did in this paper, is probably a good idea or to learn with uh, para, uh, learn with uh, efficiency. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we need to move on to the next paper. Um, so for uh, the guided filter paper, one of the questions was whether you've considered other forms for the uh, residual appearance difference. So instead of simply adding it some kind of multiplication or some uh, a fine combination or something like that. Yes, thank you. No, we haven't considered any other form uh, of the um, difference. This was just the more, most intuitive uh, way to say that each pixel uh, might be a little bit less or a little bit more intense than the um, a given template. Um, I, also feel like it's an additive uh, problem right here. I don't know about multiplication, but uh, yes, some more complicated appearance offset might be um, also a good solution in this case. <laughs> Do you expect any limitations uh, in the number or type of modalities that you can uh, combine in this? Because now if the, the, if, uh, T1 and T2 weighted MR images, which are still quite similar, Mm, yes, uh, well, I don't, I, I think that if um, there is a correlation between the modalities, it will be okay. We tested actually um, many more than just the T1 and T2. It was also uh, very different hospitals and we also included flare sequences. So um, the things that are imaginable, like uh, the typical uh, modalities uh, were working okay. Um, so I think it's actually pretty robust uh, to different modalities. Okay, great. Um, I think we should move on to the last paper. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so one question here was how the negative examples for the contrastive task are sampled. Um, how do you do that during inference time, for example? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So we actually did this taking a uh, random slice from, from the same data set. So basically when we were testing for any particular data set, we selected one random subject and from that subject one random slice for the negative, so for the image uh, X2. Um, however, this could also be potentially just an, um, say an, another slide from the same volume, for instance. Um, I was also wondering um, how important is the, the uncertainty estimation part? This is combine actually this uh, the extra task, the proxy task with that uncertainty estimation. Is that really important or does it still work reasonably well if you leave that out? So actually um, you can find sort of the results without the uncertainty estimation in our results. So it's a separate role where we just state this also provides loss. So it actually uh, still works quite well in most cases, so it's not necessary. However, uncertainty estimation gives, um, um, yeah, um, improves the results a little bit. Basically, uncertainty estimation methods in general also don't work that well for auto distribution data. So by sort of combining these, we try to find a metric that works for, um, for auto distribution cases as well. But yeah, to answer your question, you can find the results as well in the table for choose using the proxy task clause. 
uh, and the difference is not that significant, but still significant. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have time for one more question. There was one, um, someone who was wondering whether you can use this method also in general for predicting something for quality control. So telling whether the model is actually making a mistake uh, on an in-distribution sample. Oh, okay, that's a good question. I think uh, that's something that it's related to a lot of papers that we saw in this last few sessions. So um, basically, I would I would say yes, definitely. I mean, um, let me think. Of course, it would depend on the proxy task whether you would be able to find these sorts of particularities in the in distribution data. But in principle, of course, I mean, this is just about. Um, encountering something which you haven't encountered before so it should work as well we haven't tried it um, for this use case but i believe possibly okay great yeah thanks a lot um okay. yeah i'll hand the word back to nick yeah thanks a lot for the presentations and all the great questions and answers to that uh, we're now going to move on to the poster sessions where all the more deeper questions can actually be asked and answered uh, this will be back on Dollar Town and hope to see many of you there. Thanks a lot for joining.